So whilst Vlad III is in captivity when the Ottomans have got him, his father and older brother are actually killed in battle. It says when Vlad was uh, called to a diplomatic meeting in 1442 with Sultan Murad II, he brought his young sons, Vlad III and Radu, along. For centuries, Vlad the Impaler has remained frozen in time as one of history's most terrifying figures, a medieval warlord whose cruelty became legend. But in 2023, scientists managed to extract biological material from letters believed to have been touched by Vlad himself. Using cutting-edge forensic techniques, they analyzed proteins and DNA residues left behind in his sweat and fingerprints. What they found wasn't just historical data, it was something far more unsettling. So what exactly did the analysis reveal? It is a very old method of punishment, and Vlad seems to have been very fond of it. And they're full of these stories of these terrible atrocities, and they describe him as a bloodthirsty berserker and all these sorts of things. And uh, you'll see here that there are lots of pictures of... The man behind the monster. Vlad III ruled Wallachia, a region in modern-day Romania, during one of the most violent periods in European history. Born in 1431, he came of age in a world constantly torn apart by Ottoman invasions, internal betrayals, and shifting alliances. His father, Vlad II Dracul, was a member of the Order of the Dragon, a chivalric organization dedicated to defending Christendom. The name Dracula, meaning son of Dracul, wasn't sinister at first. It was a family name tied to honor and duty. But Vlad III earned a very different reputation. He became known as Vlad Tepes, which translates to Vlad the Impaler. This wasn't propaganda or exaggeration. Contemporary accounts from both enemies and allies describe his preferred method of execution in graphic detail. Impalement was slow, deliberate, and agonizing. Victims were hoisted onto wooden stakes, sometimes arranged in massive displays visible from miles away. Ottoman forces reportedly turned back at the sight of thousands of rotting corpses lining the roads into Wallachia. His reign was marked by extreme violence, but also by a strange kind of order. He executed corrupt merchants, punished theft harshly, and demanded absolute loyalty. Some historians argue he was defending his small principality against overwhelming threats. Others see a ruler who embraced cruelty as a weapon of control. Either way, his methods were so shocking that they became the foundation of a myth that outlasted the man himself. Vlad's brutality wasn't forgotten. It was transformed into something even darker when Bram Stoker borrowed his name and reputation centuries later to create Count Dracula, the immortal vampire. But the real Vlad was mortal. And now, thanks to modern science, we're starting to learn what that mortality actually looked like. Where science meets medieval mystery. Analyzing someone who lived over 500 years ago is no simple task. There are no medical records, no preserved tissue samples, and most importantly, no confirmed remains. Vlad's burial site has been debated for centuries. Some say he was laid to rest at Snagov Monastery near Bucharest. Others point to different locations scattered across Romania. Excavations at Snegov in the 1930s uncovered a headless skeleton wearing royal garments, but the remains disappeared before proper analysis could be done. Without a body, piecing together Vlad's biology seemed impossible. Then researchers took a different approach. Instead of looking for bones, they turned to objects Vlad might have touched. Historical letters written during his reign still exist in archives across Europe. These documents weren't just ink on parchment, they were handled by living people. And every time someone touched them, they left behind microscopic traces. Sweat, oils from the skin, cells sloughed off from fingers. In 2023, a team of scientists used a technique called paleoproteomics to extract proteins from these letters. They also searched for ancient DNA residues embedded in the paper fibers. This method had been used before on other historical documents, but applying it to Vlad's correspondence was groundbreaking. The team analyzed multiple letters attributed to him, comparing the biological signatures across different samples. They weren't looking for full genomes. That would be nearly impossible from such degraded material. Instead, they focused on protein markers and short DNA fragments that could reveal specific information about the person who handled the documents. The results were startling. 
The biological traces painted a picture of a man dealing with significant health issues, environmental stressors, and possibly even deliberate poisoning. It was the closest anyone had come to examining Vlad the Impaler on a molecular level. The letters that changed everything. The documents studied came from collections in Romania and Turkey. Some were military correspondence, others were diplomatic messages sent to rival rulers or allied princes. Written in a mix of Old Church Slavonic and Latin, these letters represent some of the few confirmed connections to Vlad himself. But could researchers be certain he actually touched them? That's where the science gets interesting. When you handle paper, especially under stress or in warm conditions, your fingers leave behind a biological signature. Sweat contains amino acids, salts, and trace proteins unique to your body chemistry. Over centuries, these compounds degrade, but they don't vanish entirely. Advanced mass spectrometry can detect them even in incredibly small amounts. The research team used a non-destructive sampling method called AVA film extraction. Thin polymer films were pressed onto the letter surfaces, lifting microscopic particles without damaging the originals. Those particles were then analyzed for protein sequences and DNA fragments. Multiple letters showed consistent biological markers, suggesting they were handled by the same individual or individuals in close contact. The protein profiles revealed markers associated with skin conditions and inflammatory responses. More intriguing were the environmental DNA traces. These included genetic material from plants and animals native to the Carpathian region, supporting the idea that the letters originated from Wallachia during Vlad's time. There were also unexpected findings. Some samples contained proteins linked to blood, not just human blood, but possibly animal blood as well. This could reflect the realities of medieval life where parchment production, food preparation, and violence all left biological residues on everyday objects. The researchers were careful not to make definitive claims. They couldn't say with absolute certainty that every biological trace came from Vlad himself. Secretaries, messengers, and officials would have also handled the documents. But the consistency of certain markers across multiple letters, combined with historical provenance, made a compelling case. These weren't random medieval documents. They were objects tied directly to one of history's most infamous rulers. And the biological data pulled from them told a story that written records never could. What DNA can actually tell us about a 15th century warlord? Genetic material from the 15th century is fragmented and degraded. You're not getting a clear family tree or a full medical workup. But even partial data can reveal surprising details. The DNA residues extracted from Vlad's letters were short sequences, mostly mitochondrial DNA, which is more durable than nuclear DNA and passes down through the maternal line. This type of analysis can indicate broad ancestral origins and sometimes hint at population mixtures. The preliminary findings suggested a genetic background consistent with populations from the Balkans and Eastern Europe, which aligns with what historians already knew about the Basarab dynasty. But there were also traces suggesting possible admixture with Turkic or Cuman groups. This isn't shocking. Medieval Wallachia was a crossroads of cultures. The Cumans were a Turkic nomadic people who migrated into the region centuries before Vlad's time, and intermarriage between local nobility and Cuman tribes was common. Vlad's own ancestry has been debated, with some historians suggesting mixed heritage that might have included influences from beyond the traditional Romanian nobility. Beyond ancestry, certain genetic markers hinted at predispositions to specific health conditions. Some of the protein profiles showed elevated markers for inflammatory responses, which could indicate chronic infections or autoimmune issues. In the medieval period, untreated infections were a constant threat. Even minor wounds could lead to severe complications. Vlad spent much of his life in military campaigns, living in unsanitary conditions and enduring physical stress. It's entirely plausible that his body bore the scars of repeated illnesses. There were also indications of metabolic stress, proteins associated with prolonged physical exertion and inadequate nutrition appeared in some samples. This paints a picture of a ruler constantly on the move, under threat, and likely dealing with the physical toll of leadership in a brutal era. It's a reminder that behind the legend was a human being whose body struggled with the same vulnerabilities as anyone else, even if his actions were anything but ordinary. The medical profile hidden in ancient traces. 
One of the most intriguing aspects of the analysis involved dermatological markers. Several protein sequences pointed to conditions affecting the skin, possibly chronic dermatitis or another inflammatory skin disorder. Medieval rulers weren't immune to such issues. Poor hygiene, exposure to harsh weather, and stress all contributed to skin problems. But some researchers raised another possibility. Could these markers be linked to a condition called porphyria? Porphyria is a group of rare genetic disorders that affect the production of heme, a component of hemoglobin. Some forms cause severe sensitivity to sunlight, leading to blistering, scarring, and discoloration of the skin. In extreme cases, it can cause neurological symptoms, including aggression, paranoia, and altered behavior. Historically, some have speculated that porphyria might explain certain vampire-like symptoms in folklore, but this theory is controversial and not widely accepted. Still, the possibility that Vlad might have suffered from a condition affecting his skin and potentially his behavior adds another layer to his already complex legacy. Beyond skin conditions, there were signs of possible respiratory issues. Proteins linked to chronic inflammation in the airways were present in some samples. Tuberculosis was rampant in medieval Europe, and it's possible Vlad was exposed or even infected at some point. Chronic coughing, weakness, and night sweats would have been common symptoms, yet he continued ruling and fighting. This suggests either remarkable resilience or simply no alternative. In his world, showing weakness could mean death. There were also traces suggesting gastrointestinal stress. Markers for digestive inflammation could indicate parasitic infections, food poisoning, or chronic gastric issues. Medieval diets were often heavy, poorly preserved, and contaminated. Dysentery and similar conditions killed as many soldiers as battle did. If Vlad suffered from recurring stomach problems, it would have compounded the physical and mental strain of leadership. Pain, discomfort, and illness were constant companions in that era, and they likely shaped the temperament and decisions of rulers far more than we usually consider. Blood, ancestry, and unexpected origins. The genetic traces also reignited old debates about Vlad's true lineage. The House of Basarab, to which Vlad belonged, claimed descent from a founder named Basarab I, who established Wallachia's independence in the 14th century. But the origins of Basarab himself are murky. Some chronicles suggest he had Cuman roots, others point to a possible mix of Romanian and Hungarian nobility. Genetic analysis, even incomplete, offers a way to test these theories. The presence of genetic markers associated with Central Asian and Turkic populations supports the idea of Cuman ancestry. This wouldn't have been unusual. The Cumans dominated the Eurasian steppes before being absorbed into surrounding populations. Intermarriage with local ruling families was a political strategy. If Vlad carried genetic traces of this heritage, it would explain certain physical descriptions in historical texts that noted his dark features and strong build, traits sometimes attributed to steppe ancestry. There's also the question of his paternal line. Vlad's father was allied with the Ottomans at times and held hostage by them at others. Vlad himself spent part of his youth as a prisoner in the Ottoman court. Could there have been biological connections to Turkic or Ottoman lineages beyond simple political alliances? The DNA data isn't conclusive enough to answer that, but it raises fascinating questions about identity and power in a region where bloodlines were often as tangled as the politics. Understanding Vlad's ancestry also matters for tracking the spread of certain genetic conditions. If his lineage included populations prone to specific hereditary diseases, it could explain some of the health markers found in the samples. It also adds complexity to the myth of Dracula. The fictional vampire is often portrayed as an ancient, pure-blooded aristocrat. The real Vlad may have been far more genetically diverse, a product of centuries of migration, conquest, and survival in a volatile region. Signs of Violence, written in genetic code. Vlad's life was defined by violence, both inflicted and endured. He fought in dozens of battles, faced assassination attempts, and lived under constant threat. Could the DNA and protein analysis reveal traces of that violence? In some cases, yes. Certain protein markers indicated past trauma. Healing injuries leave behind biochemical signatures. Elevated stress hormones, scarring proteins, and immune responses all show up in tissue chemistry. Though the researchers were analyzing residue, not living tissue, patterns consistent with chronic stress and repeated physical trauma were present. 
One particularly striking finding involved proteins associated with wound healing. The presence of these markers suggests Vlad may have sustained injuries that required significant recovery time. Given his reputation and lifestyle, this isn't surprising. Medieval combat was brutal. Swords, arrows, and blunt weapons caused devastating injuries. Even a non-fatal wound could lead to infection and long-term complications. Vlad likely bore scars, both visible and internal, from decades of warfare. There were also subtle signs of repetitive strain. Markers linked to joint inflammation and muscle stress appeared in some samples. This could reflect the physical demands of wearing armor, riding horses for long hours, and engaging in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Medieval knights and warlords often developed chronic pain conditions from the sheer physical toll of their lifestyles. Vlad would have been no exception. The image of the Impaler as an unstoppable force of terror is compelling, but the biological data paints a more human picture. A man whose body paid the price for his choices. The poisoning theory that won't go away. Vlad's death in 1476 remains shrouded in mystery. Most accounts agree he was killed in battle against the Ottomans, but the details vary wildly. Some say he was ambushed by his own men. Others claim he died fighting valiantly. A few suggest he was assassinated after the battle, possibly by rivals within Wallachia itself. One persistent theory is that he was poisoned, either before or after his death, as part of a betrayal. The biological analysis added fuel to this theory. Some samples contained trace elements consistent with toxic exposure. Arsenic and mercury were common poisons in the medieval period, used both for medicine and murder. Elevated levels of these metals can sometimes be detected in ancient biological material, though contamination from the environment is also possible. The researchers found markers that could indicate chronic low-level exposure to heavy metals. This doesn't prove poisoning, but it doesn't rule it out either. If Vlad was poisoned, it would fit the broader pattern of his life. Betrayal was a constant threat. His own father and older brother were killed by political enemies. Vlad himself overthrew rivals and executed those he deemed disloyal. In such a world, poisoning was a practical tool. Slow poisoning could weaken a ruler without immediately drawing suspicion. Combined with the stress and illness markers already present, it's possible Vlad's health was deliberately undermined over time, making him more vulnerable when enemies finally struck. The truth may never be fully known, but the biological clues are tantalizing. Why his DNA matters beyond the legend. Understanding Vlad's biology does more than satisfy curiosity. It offers a window into the realities of medieval life, especially for those in power. Rulers like Vlad are often mythologized, turned into symbols of terror or heroism depending on perspective. But they were still human, subject to disease, injury, and the same genetic vulnerabilities as anyone else. Analyzing their remains or traces helps historians move beyond legend and engage with the past in a more grounded way. The techniques used on Vlad's letters also have broader implications. Paleoproteomics and ancient DNA analysis are transforming how we study history. Objects once considered purely symbolic or textual now hold biological data. Letters, manuscripts, clothing, and weapons can all preserve traces of the people who used them. This opens up possibilities for studying figures who left no physical remains or whose burial sites have been lost. It also raises ethical questions about how we handle historical artifacts and the genetic information they contain. For Romania and the broader Balkans, Vlad's legacy is complicated. He's both a national hero who defended his land against overwhelming odds and a symbol of medieval brutality. Genetic research adds nuance to that legacy. It shows a man shaped by his environment, his ancestry, and his health in ways that written records alone can't capture. It also challenges simplistic narratives. Vlad wasn't just a monster or a martyr. He was a product of his time, carrying the biological and cultural scars of a brutal era. Understanding that complexity makes the history richer and more honest. The DNA of Vlad the Impaler reveals more than just ancestry or illness. It shows us the fragility hidden beneath the legend. A warlord feared across Europe, yet vulnerable to the same diseases, injuries, and betrayals that claimed countless others. The terrifying truth isn't that he was inhuman, 
It's that he was all too human and still capable of such cruelty.